give you the floor. Great. So of course, uh, everyone who's here and who will be joining us in the near future uh, knows uh, everything about Susan. I mean, Susan uh, is a very important figure in contemporary political thinking, in contemporary cultural studies. And actually, Susan, I will read what Wikipedia says about you. So Susan Buck Morris is an American philosopher and intellectual historian. She is currently professor of political science at the CUNY Graduate Center, while CUNY is City University of New York, and professor emeritus in the government department at Cornell University, where she taught from 78, 1978 to 2012. Her interdisciplinary work involves, but is not limited to the fields of art history, architecture, comparative literature, cultural studies, German studies, history, philosophy, and visual studies. And now uh, there's also about the, uh, a line about your grants. She has won a Getty Scholar Grant, a Fulbright Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship for her work. And then a list of your books. And of course, your books are well known. Uh, the Origin of Negative Dialectics, The Dialectics of Seeing, Dream World and Catastrophe, Thinking Past Terror, Hegel, Haiti, and Universal History, something that I would like to add, probably I will, Revolution Today, and of course, the book that we will be discussing, uh, Year One, A Philosophical Recounting. So this is a brief introduction to Susan, who uh, besides uh, being a very important scholar, is a dear friend. And so we are especially grateful and uh, incredibly happy to welcome her in this Zoom because uh, this is not so much a formal meeting as a meeting of friends. But uh, we are also thankful for Susan's generosity because tonight she will be sharing some of her thoughts on a new approach to history. And we are very excited to hear more about that. So thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, you know how delighted I am to be here. And uh, I, I, I don't know if everybody was here, but this uh, book that I'm talking about uh, is brand new and I didn't even get a copy yet. Although I heard today that in the office at Cornell, 20 copies were delivered uh, MIT Press, but the uh, press did not give me this copy. This copy I had to get from amazon.com. Uh, it got to me about four days ago. So um, this is the book, it's called Year One. I didn't want a subtitle, but uh, you need a subtitle. So the subtitle is a philosophical recounting. And it literally is about the first century, which is very weird because it's new territory for me to say the least. And I don't know why I felt it necessary to go back to the first century, but it seemed uh, that it was fine to say um, that we were finished with Eurocentrism or uh, you know, that uh, we were now uh, beyond this, uh, 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 you know, we were in a post-colonial mode that was beyond this Eurocentricity. And yet the very naming of the years is Eurocentric. And, and the whole, if you look, if you try to use the concept of history, there's just no way you can avoid a certain uh, uh, a trap. And I wouldn't, I don't call it Western centricity, but it's modernity. And it's the kind of modernity that is very familiar as well in Russia because uh, uh, the Soviet experience uh, was an experience in modernization. And um, uh, so time had to move quickly in order to get to the level of industrialization that was commensurate with modernity. So, I mean, this is something that structures, you know, if we think of it in a kind of Kantian way, structures our thought and our, uh, and our um, understanding uh, is uh, maybe something we have to really get at at a very deep level and, and put into question. Uh, because, um, so this is just a little sentence that I wrote some time ago. It's not in the book exactly like this, but anyway, in writing year one, I had to give up categories of understanding that dictated what could be seen. So 
critical awareness of Eurocentrism or Orientalism or racism, sexism, colonialism, that wasn't enough. The forms of research, the conceptual frames were all wrong. Research findings kept spilling out, rebelling against even our sophisticated critiques. Central was the problematic of the very category of history. You know, I mean, try to try to put content into the concept of history. It's really hard, it's really hard. Because if you wipe away histories, secularizing, scientizing, sequentializing chronological sequence, right? Schema of understanding in a Kantian sense, you are left without a compass. You don't know where to go in time. The moves to turn history into temporalities or historicality or historicity are not sufficient because they work backward, formulating alternative concepts and then applying them rather than listening to a past. And this is my point, the past, if you actually pay attention to the past with the best of historians and not the philosophers like Hegel, but the historians who actually deal with it, yeah? Uh, what you find is that the past doesn't have any interest in entering our conversations, whether our mainstream conversations or our critiques. The past has no interest in us. It doesn't care about us. And that, that's uh, you know, kind of depressing because we like to think of it as our past, particularly if we can think about Russian history or European history or someone else's vertical slice of history as if it belonged to that collective. And I am suggesting instead that vertical slices of history are totally um, uh, distorting of the past and that we have to somehow develop in this era of universal situation, whether it's viruses or uh, climate change or uh, the other situations that seem to be rather universal at the time, that what we have to develop instead is a communist inheritance of the past. It doesn't belong to anyone. Now that you can see that already I'm in trouble <laughs> with a lot of people, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, uh, how do you have a, a state like Pakistan or Israel based on a common inheritance of the past if there is no common inheritance of the, pardon me, of a, of a vertical slice of history that makes your past if in fact you allow that past to belong to everyone or no one, right? That, and also you're in trouble with some parts of the uh, 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 African-American identity movement. You're in trouble with that too, because the idea is not that there's this separate situation, right? But that there is a shared situation. And so I feeling that that um, politically is our reality uh, the idea of the book is to write to uh, a, a we, an us, right? A collective that is alive today. <laughs> That's the only requisite you need. You have to be alive as a reader. And as I die, then whatever readers are there, it's their history, right? So there's a way that uh, you uh, privilege, and I have a I have a quotation, which I will put in here. Um, I have a little slide for it, but I think it's quicker for me to find it here because it's the end of the introduction. So the collective that is addressed in this book is a generation, just as those who lived in the first century experienced a reality that all of us do not share uh, so we alive today have our time in common. In the context of the stands taken in this book, all of us are descendant of survivors in history who have witnessed, suffered, and perpetrated history's horrors. 
we have that in common. One way or another, the mothers who bore us escaped annihilation, giving to each of us a year one. And that is no small legacy to share. We have that in common. We're alive. I mean, you know, that's like sort of dumb, but I, it's where I start, you know. So I'm speaking to people who are reading. Um, and not to future generations or in response to my forefathers. I mean, the whole idea of forefathers is quite frankly, a very sexist. Um, it's father to son, father to son, father to son. And a lot of uh, knowledge is passed down in that way. Now, I wanted to uh, pick up on one other thing before I start what I had sort of planned to say, and that is, um, this idea of a practice, uh, uh, philosophy as a practice. Um, that seems to be a theme for you all. And I see it in, um, in uh, Marmardashvili's work uh, and have a kind of accord, a kind of sympathy with this approach. So this is Marmardashvili from The Problem of Man in Philosophy. And he's talking about freedom. He says, freedom cannot be expressed verbally. It is something that is done by man. Freedom is that which is created by freedom. So this is what I understand as a philosophy of praxis. And um, I, I want, that to be understood because uh, this book is not about the content of the first century so much as the doing of history. So, you know, for instance, you know, year one, it's supposed to be, if it's about the first century, you know, Jesus is supposed to be part of it. Well, he's in the index more than I was aware, but he's, in I think the body of the texts twice. I mean, he's just not a big figure if you're a person in the first century, he's not a big figure. So we have to let go of it as having its importance only as the birth of Christ, because I cannot believe that Jesus would have said, I am your one. He never said that. It's not in the, uh, it's not in the uh, 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 New Testament anywhere. I mean, and you can't, you can't imagine anything about this, anything we know or even imagine about this character standing there saying, I am year one. A one person did that. And that was of course, uh, uh, Augustus uh, as emperor who called himself Princeps, the first. He was the first, time belonged to him. And political leaders do that. Stalin did that as well. They claim time for themselves. It's an act of appropriation. So, uh, so that is um, kind of where that begins. This Oh, and so the idea is that I have a hard time. I hate this thing that we're supposed to do in all of our writing. I know you have experienced this. You're supposed to write uh, a three line abstract of something you just, you know, 400 pages that you just spent 10 years doing. Okay. Here is the three, now you have it, right? Here are the three lines, you've got it. No, no, because the book is about the practice of reading it. It's, it's a book that's supposed to surprise you as you read it. Um, and so it's hard for me to, to talk about it. One thing it's not is a new, a new model for the first century. Now we really know what it means. No, 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 it's simply a way of, of considering the uh, construct of the first century against the grain uh, in order to rescue a certain kind of truth. And um, I get at this truth through um, a method which I call translation. And here I do draw on Walter Benjamin, uh, who is someone who has influenced me a lot. Uh, and I draw on the idea that translation changes not just the original language, but the language into which it's being translated. It works to change both sides of the equation. 
both languages. But for me, these languages are, are, are historically distant. And so what you have to do is translate between historical moments as opposed in, to the uh, horizontal translation among words. So the idea is a method of translation uh, as a way of dealing with the past that does not appropriate the past, does not say, this is mine, I decide what it means, but actually loses oneself in the past in a way that you come back then to the present with a very, very different uh, consciousness of, of time. So uh, that's, that's the attempt, you know, so whether it is achieved or not is a good question. Now, what I'm going to do now is uh, share with you uh, the screen that has a lot of pieces. Oh, also, the book is written in fragments. You know, it's kind of fragmented. So uh, it doesn't, it goes kind of back and forth in time, sideways, World War II, right today, before, you know, it's all over. Putin is mentioned once, Trump is mentioned once, but so is um, Descartes and so is Rigori. And so, I mean, these people make appearances. Uh, they make appearances and then they disappear, you know, and then the next page might have Jesus and then he disappears. In other words, uh, there's a kind of freeing from this uh, grid of chronological time uh, which incidentally is the inaccurate translation of the word chronos in, uh, in Koine, which is first century Greek. Chronos is not chronology, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but chronos is chronic. I don't know if there's a, a, a Russian word, but it means repetitive. So what's, what's chronic is something like the seasons or um, life and death, or anything that goes in a cyclical, and like a circle, that, uh, that moves in kind of repetition, as opposed to chaos, which is the temporality of, of, uh, of, of change. Uh, and so these, these words are allowed uh, to have their meaning that they had, which is not the meaning we give it. Right, so this is the way you work with, actually you're working with words, but you're, work, you're trying to figure out what do these words name in the first century? And to do that, you have to realize that truth is transitory. So I do believe that truth can be talked about by philosophers. I'm not someone who thinks that just to mention truth is a, a violation of everything that modernity has accomplished truth it matters it's out there it's just hard to grasp and it goes away again so every time you think you have it uh, don't hold on to it because it's going to take another form it's going to be transient uh, and that's what saves the for me the idea of truth from um, dogmatism right so i open up philosophy to transcendence which of course in modernity is made synonymous with religion. And that's wrong, it's not correct. I open it up to transcendence uh, and that frightened someone like Kant because he wanted to stay descriptive, transcendental, you know, transcendental, but not trans transcendence because he was afraid that equaled religion which in his time did equal dogmatism. But that doesn't mean that just because Kant had to put aside transcendence, that that's, that truth remains true always, in all situations, for all people, for all time. And uh, you know, Adorno was very sensitive to this. Adorno said, you know, uh, the, the prejudice of philosophers is that truth has to be eternal. It has to be changeless, uh, but it doesn't. It can only be, or only needs to be temporary. So I think that will give me, that last line will give me a way into a certain place in my PowerPoint, which I'm gonna share with you. Maybe it's gonna work that way, maybe it's not, but let's see. 
Share screen. Okay, share. Okay, now I have to find the exact line I want it to use. Uh, this is badly done. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so uh, this transiency of truth, I consider really important. Uh, so I'm going to read just the blue uh, 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 part. These are just things I cut and pasted from the manuscript. So we take, I take as accurate the one constant that Theodore Adorno allowed for philosophy. And here's the quotation, that there is no category no valid concept that might be might not be rendered invalid at the moment when it is cut off from the concrete context to which it really belongs. So what that means is not, and also for Adorno, is not, oh, truth is relative. So, you know, it's only relative to a certain, no, truth changes its form. But it's the same truth. It just doesn't stay in the same place. So for instance, um, I had an interesting, we, we, we read um, Hegel, Hegel's master slave dialectic in my seminar last week, along with Hegel and Haiti, which was my take on that. And, and also uh, uh, Kozhev, uh, who has a really, good interpretation of the phenomenology, the beginning of the phenomenology and the master-slave dialectic. Uh, and I asked my students, um, you know, okay, so we don't have slavery, but where is the master-slave dialectic still, still, still with us in some form? How do you have to translate it for it to become alive again? And there was a discussion and it came to this idea that, um, that the police violence in the United States is a struggle to death. This is the beginning of the master-slave dialectic because of fear, fear on both sides. So the police are afraid because the United States has civilians armed with, with weapons of war. You know we have 300 billion uh, weapons uh, in private hands. Imagine being a policeman in that country. It's very frightening, right? And, uh, and the whole thing is supposed to be a coherent system, but right at the place where the police are confronted with uh, the, those people who are not living the American dream and are not part of the situation, right there, there is fear of death on both sides. Fear of death on both sides. and so that fear of death that starts a kind of a dynamic of domination, submission, et cetera, may be, um, insight, it may be insightful to see it in that context, even though slavery we know of course is long gone, you know, or, and maybe it's not wage slavery that's important as Marx said, maybe it's another translation of this situation. But uh, that's just, maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. It, it made sense in our class and I thought it was kind of nice. Um, and I, I guess, I think there may be earlier stuff here that let's just take a look what we have here. Okay, so here's one. Uh, uh, year one is a project in the reconfiguration of knowledge. The focus is on the first century, all of the schemata of modernity, time, space, conceptual differentiations and the categories of collective belonging are put to the test of comprehending this supposed beginning and none survives unscathed. The epistemological apparatus that modernity calls history was supposed to hold the past in place in an order leading to the present in coherent narrative form. But history writing itself provides knowledge that overturns this ordering presumption, freeing the past to speak otherwise. So this is the idea. If we're really serious about getting away from this, um, um, you know, neo-colonial structuring, then we have to we have to go very deep. So, for instance, for me, and this I'm just reading from the middle. In the first century, 
the three most fundamental categories of historical narratives, Hellenism, Christianity, and Judaism, distort the evidence. Athens versus Jerusalem, East versus West, do not make sense of the first century world. The conventional approach of allotting historical material to separate disciplines of classics, theology, and the modern secular humanities is seriously misleading. The search for origins of distinct groups leads not to a purified source, but rather to the disappearance of the separations themselves. So, I mean, it's, um, it's kind of, you know, why the first century? It's only because that gives you a place to experience this undermining of the bedrock understandings of history. So what I'm suggesting is neither a philosophy of history, think Hegel, or a history of philosophy, think the way we teach philosophy in the academy, but rather philosophy and history. Philosophy and history, there's a quote, there's a, uh, yeah. So something new is being proposed, therefore, philosophy and history, present and past in simultaneous arrangement. And then I say this task is difficult to describe in the introduction, you're supposed to give a summary of the book in the introduction, right? Then you're supposed to give it again at the end of the book as a conclusion, and my book does neither. Uh, I want to try to show it as a practice, as a practice of reading. That's the, the aim. And the goal is then a communist inheritance of the past. Um, okay, so here in the middle here, modernity does not have the power to transcend entrenched differences on the basis of its own inventions because the names of recent theoretical initiatives um, wait, I, I'm missing the line that I need. Okay, but the names of recent theoretical initiatives, postmodern, postcolonial, post secular, are indicative of the inadequacy of the attempts to leave the recent past behind. We're holding on, as long as we're saying post, we're holding on to the original category. We just can't leave it behind, right? Um, so um, the reason, of course, therefore, we, is that modernity's own concepts hold the past in place. And so without letting the past to liberate the past from those concepts is to allow a different configuration of knowledge. Um, and so, oh yeah, so that, that here's that part, right? So uh, Adorno on repeated occasions compared the modern philosopher's predicament to the marvelous tale of the Baron von Munchausen you know this uh, wonderful thing, Baron von Munchausen, uh, who having fallen into the swamp in a horse, tried to pull himself out by his own pigtail. So here is the Baron von Munchausen. See, he's fallen in the swamp. He's tried to pull himself out. But of course, and this was a very famous uh, story in the, in the 19th century. And he, and he the, of course, the thing is, in the story, he does it. He, he succeeds. It's, it's taxing. It's tiring. But he makes it. He's, he gets out. So, um, but this is, in my estimation, the problem of trying to uh, rescue ourselves from the present post condition by using the concepts that got us into the swamp in the first place. That's the idea. Okay, so... Uh, now, um, I'm going to just move ahead. Yeah, because this is the part that maybe uh, Alek uh, can respond to because he, because this, this first part of the uh, second chapter uh, was published in the journal October. And uh, it, it is this method of trans translation. Um, and I'm not going to give that whole thing um, because I've already talked a little bit about it. Um, so how then are these two forms of knowledge, history and philosophy, to be connected? And the idea is to use the idea of translation. Um, 
And then translation is like the, there's a whole mess in there that we won't get into because it's long and complicated and I promise not to speak too much. So um, the idea is that other philosophers, particularly those from the non-West have recognized that translation is a process intrinsic to philosopher. So this one guy, Suleimania Bashir Deyanya, he is a, a, a he is a professor at Columbia University, uh, and he's from uh, Senegal, and he's Muslim in origin, and he refers to philosoph philosophical translation as lateral universality. Philosophy, he says, can only be universal if it moves across differences. It is distance that constitutes philosophy. He's talking about linguistic distance, that is a philosophy in one culture and another, but the claim might be applied to temporal distance as well. Um, and this is from another uh, uh, philosopher, Polish Jewish English writing philosopher, Agata Bielek Robson. And she writes, the only way to reach universality is horizontal, never pretending to abandon the realm of particularity. The way leading through translation, making various languages clash, marry, meet, befriend, mingle with, and confront one another, right? So um, this idea of uh, um, having to go through translation as a prerequisite of philosophy is something that other uh, philosophers have noted as well. Uh, and I, I, it's the model, it's the idea. So in this case, it's us today trying to translate um, what historians have found out about the first century, which of course, the original kind of structures of history of the first century were dominated by Christian philosophers like Hegel. And he didn't know anything. I mean, it was because of Hegel that people have written good history because he said history was the realization of reason in the world. So history became important philosophically to demonstrate the progress of human thought, right? But he didn't know himself very much. And particularly when it comes to Hegel, Hegelian Hellenism, it's one of the, it, it just really, really bad history. And so I use a lot of the, what the historians have found out that just makes Hegel's ideas uh, totally mythical. Uh, so a lot of that takes place in the book. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the Benjamin thing and why, but Benjamin, it's really interesting. Um, uh, uh, Cause of course Marx and therefore the whole Soviet experience also uh, um, has this notion, yeah, this is interesting. Um, oh, never mind that, it's too complex, too complex, never mind that. The idea is, yeah, okay, okay, we have to get there. So we have to say something about what's going on in this part of the argument. Um, uh, you know, if you have this progressive notion of history, right? then the past becomes, you can throw it out, you can dismiss it because uh, it's somehow whatever was valuable in it has been uh, preserved and the rest of it is, is uh, not important. Um, and then of course you build this into a notion, this is the really bad thing politically, a notion that you know uh, anybody living in, the, in 1917 who was not either Germany great history Germany had, right? Or uh, the United States, that is, was not developed in the sense of industrial modernization, was behind in the race to catch up in history. So then the whole Soviet project became catch up with a, a form of development that now has led us to the Anthropocene problem of the uh, destruction of the planet, right? So that was a unfortunate thing that happened, but it was based on this notion of progress and, and Marx has that totally, but Benjamin doesn't, he really doesn't. And he never went for this idea of a childhood of um, earlier societies 
or uneven development or anything of that nature. And uh, so he allows us to work in a different way. And when I spoke before of fragments being put together, the idea here is uh, 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 constructing constellations out of past and present. Uh, so analogy, analogic replaces chronologic in the construction of constellations. And so my work is then the construction of constellations. I told Helen I had nothing to say, and now I realize that I've talked for 46 minutes and I can't, uh, I don't wanna to talk uh, too much. So I'm not gonna talk about the specifics, just kind of tell you that it's all about music. Music is really important. Um, music is crucial. Musical ratio, hearing, hearing philosophy, you know, hearing it, that's very important. And I think uh, I will get to, yeah, this guy. Uh, this is Coltrane, an, a jazz musician of some note in the United States, who had a notion of music as a transcendent, something outside of us that we tried to get, tried to capture. And that's very different from the romantic notion of the, uh, um, of the artist as the creative person from whom come these great things. No, even Einstein thought that, you know, ideas came from outside, right? So this is the idea of the transcendent, which you're able to access, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, if you're lucky. So that's where Coltrane comes into the picture. He's with uh, Philo of Alexandria. Then we get into this whole to on, o on, very, very important in a, in a philosophical sense, but we're not going there right now. I will just have this picture. This is where the Philo of Alexandria uh, chapter ends up. Uh, this is, uh, I think it's really interesting if you look at uh, like Adorno and Horkheimer, they were so critical of the me mechanistic treatment of knowledge that determined modernity. But we're out of that and we're into something else. This is, uh, there's a new kind of microscopic optic technology which allows us to see stuff. I mean, remember the old days when in order to understand a butterfly, you killed it and pinned it onto a piece of paper. Now you put up a camera and you watch it do its thing, right? Well, this is the same thing that's happening here. This happens to be a, a vlastos, that is the beginning of actually life and, and, the, and the separation of cells. And, and you watch it, right? And it's kind of beautiful. So aesthetics and philosophy come together there. Okay, so that's from my husband's lab. Now we move to, okay, now I'm gonna take you very quickly, uh, just uh, take you quickly to, I mean, there are pictures of actual things in, the, in that century, but I wanted to take you to this. Oh, this one I love. And actually it's not too well done in the book, but I love it. Um, okay, so what you, have, what you have on the left is a page from a manuscript of, uh, uh, of the 10th century done in Andalus in Iberian Spain uh, during the Muslim era. Um, and it was a manuscript that illuminated the book of Revelation. So I don't know if you read the book of Revelation recently, and you may not, if you, if you have, thought of this one little, it's written on the top, uh, this one little um, uh, quotation, uh, which is from Revelation 8, 1. And then there was silence in the heavens. And this is the way uh, the illustrators did this. And here is the same, exactly the same in a ceiling uh, painting on the top of a cave church in Lalibala in Ethiopia. Th this was it. <laughs> I mean, I love that. Uh, but then I also love the fact that the next line in the book of Revelation is, and then there was silence in the heavens for about a half an hour. Now, everybody doesn't like that, you know, half an hour. What's a half an hour doing in there? It's such an arbitrary, you know, no, no, no. Because telling time in the first century, uh, uh, what 
was that there were 12 hours in the day, but they could only be uh, seen on a sundial. And consequently, hours of daylight were shorter in winter and longer in summer. So a half an hour would be shorter in summer, uh, would be uh, longer in summer than in winter. But the beauty of it is that uh, halfway, uh, halfway in the day always would be exactly 12 noon. The sun would always be just overhead. In other words, you have to totally give up your, your, your very mechanical notion of a half an hour in order to understand uh, the revelatory significance of, uh, of this. It's complicated. Anyway, uh, so then the next uh, one is the problem. The problem is not so much uh, the Bible. The problem is when power takes over. This is Constantine. You know, it says, I won the battle because the Christian God was my God. That's the beginning of the end of anything progressive that could come out of it, right? So uh, anyway, it goes through, uh, just to show you the, the fragments that come together, uh, the uh, um, last days of Pompeii, which was a way of uh, depicting the, um, because it's 79, it's in the first century, right? Depicting the book of Revelation became a, a, a drama that was uh, performed out of doors. And this is taking place in Coney Island, New York on the beach as a grand extravaganza and fireworks would go off as Pompeii would explode. And you know it was a great thing. But my point is that uh, that has nothing to do with the actual book of Revelation and its meaning. Okay, so, oh, this is also very beautiful, right? You, you know this, this wonderful, um, wonderful uh, a set of uh, 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 drawings by Blake that illustrate the book of Revelation. Uh, so we're not gonna go through any of that here because we don't have time, we don't have time. But then there's a whole thing on women and I think there's something else. Oh, oh, no, I don't think I'll do that. Um, well, I could do this. Okay, so uh, you know in uh, Benjamin's uh, uh, thesis on the philosophy of history, he has a dwarf of theology who gets inside a chess playing puppet called historical materialism and through a system of mirrors guides the hands of the puppet so it wins every time. Now, a, a lot of people say, oh, this proves that Benjamin was a theological thinker. But if you think of truth as transient, then you have to realize that in the historical context of Stalinism in which Benjamin was writing of theology, was writing, uh, it, it required of theology that it infiltrate the secular texts of Marx so that their truth would not be lost. In other words, the truth, there are, there's truth in Marx's text, but Stalin destroyed it with the ABCs of communism. And in order to keep it alive, you have to infiltrate at that historical moment, um, these texts with theology. Uh, and I compare that with a strategy of African-American readings of the book of Revelation, um, which also read against the grain and keep a certain truth of it alive at the time when the master class was telling African-American slaves that St. Paul had said, slaves be obedient to your masters. And St. Paul is really important because if you're just a European, philosopher, you know that St. Paul is the darling of Slavoj Žižek and Alain Badiou. Paul is the good guy, but don't tell that to an African-American, right? Because that is, uh, Paul is the guy who was read to them in order to keep them in their place. So, um, the, so the idea is to allow for the transiency of context and um, temporality of philosophy without turning it into relativism. Because the consequence is not relativism, but as Adorno said, from the first moment that he realized as a teenager, the importance of the idea of relativism, the relativism of truth, 
that doesn't make truth impossible to articulate. It absolutely tells you that that is the relative context in which something is true. It's the, but you have to give up the notion that truth to be truth has to be eternal. So it's this, um, okay. So I guess you're I'm trying to show you uh, how, uh, oh dear. I think, is there a last one? There's no last one that we can do here. I, I, I hope, I, you know, as I say, this book is 400 pages. And of course, in typical fashion, uh, my pages are, uh, let's go back to this, it's very nice. Or I'll get out, I'll get out of sharing my screen. Stop sharing, okay. Um, just to give you some idea of this crazy project, because it is a crazy project. And as I say, it's not really on the first century, and yet it keeps digging up material in the first century. And its goal is, you know, uh, given the transiency of truth, what kind of philosophical method, uh, what kind of philosophical practice is adequate to that situation? So I think I'll end here and then hopefully we'll have enough time for, for discussion. Well, thank you, Susan, very much. This is very exciting and uh, somewhat complicated, I must admit, because, uh, uh, you know, sometimes an example um, is, is telling of the method, uh, but, but still, still, I mean, there is a lot to discuss. And so maybe uh, there are some questions coming from the audience or, or right away some remarks. I mean, I would be very happy to, um, to hear people speak up. So ladies and gentlemen, this is your moment, please. Well, Susan, okay. Uh, so while everyone is still thinking, um, I think I do have a question. Uh, you said you worked uh, in terms of constellations, the Benjaminian constellation, which brings me back to another concept of his, uh, namely that of the dialectical image. Right. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, the, I mean, this is a difficult uh, concept. And again, it's uh, taken largely from his thesis on the philosophy of history. That's just for some of you who might not be aware of where it comes from. But uh, the way I read it, I mean, that may be totally mistaken. I mean, I don't insist, was um, a sense of combining, uh, well, let's say the empirical level. Well, a dialectical image can be anything actually a thing, you know, a piece of the past, uh, an evidence of the past, a memory uh, for that matter, anything material in, in the broad sense. But also it's a way of reading the thing, uh, a way of reading, of interpreting, which is not um, separate from the thing itself. So for me, uh, it wasn't, um, let's say, a method that would be imposed upon, uh, upon the thing that we choose to interpret, but rather uh, a non, um, how should I say, a non transcendental image of, uh, of, of work, of, of the work of interpretation, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, of course, what worries me is, uh, the um, status of transcendence in your account, because you speak of transcendence. And of course, uh, uh, this is something uh, that, of course, you try to redeem, but also that worries us in the sense that, uh, well, for example, lately we have been trying to work in terms of, uh, of the Greek elements or what the pre-Socratics may have termed as the elements. Again, this is about a certain logic of connections, of relations, and not just you know a picture, a figure. So um, it's interesting to see uh, how you um, uh, to understand how you um, account for this uh, uh, method. Let's let's put it that way. Uh, or, and of course, the place of transcendence in your uh, in your account. So what is it specifically? So, I mean, would the elements be like uh, Lucretius's atoms? Would that be an element, Helen? Or is it more earth, air, fire, water? No, it's air, fire, water. It's this okay. other thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's more like a certain logic of elements. And what Oleg likes, I mean, I've been actually going through 
the English translation of his text, and he likes to speak of a mixture of elements, not just, you know, fire, water uh, being separate from each other, but uh, changes or transformation uh, taking place at the borderline where the elements meet, where they mingle, where they mix, and so on. Let me, he can speak for himself. But uh, it's just a, a schema or a scheme for interpreting, uh, let's say, contemporary society as well, because uh, a lot of things are in suspension and it's very hard to account for, for process. You know, I mean, whatever you mean by process. So, uh, but, uh, yes, yes. Transitory uh, things. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, a couple of uh, uh, comments there. I mean, the dialectical image is really, really hard. I use the word historical image a couple of times. I don't push on the dialectical image. I think we are trying to, uh, in common, in this common moment that we share, uh, this is, would be my point, are trying to develop strategies as academics, intellectuals, philosophers, develop filmmakers, to develop strategies of, um, of, uh, of uh, dealing with borders or mixtures or, or not, you know, diasporas or, you know, in other words, uh, not holding to boundaries. I think we're really, really trying to do that. And the old way not to hold to boundaries was to be a French intellectual and say, the French discovered universality with the universal human rights in the French Revolution. And from there on, all we have to do is insist that the rest of the world adopt our position because we have it, we have the truth. To me, that is just what we, the kind of universality we have to struggle against. So um, on the one hand, I would not consider this strategy. I mean, this one, what happens is I go to the first century because some of the major differences, religious differences, Right. Um, how those religious religious differences play into political boundaries. I'm thinking of Israel here. I'm thinking of uh, the idea of the Christian Christian Europe or uh, Christ, you know. The, the, so the religious boundaries uh, are the ones I'm really after because they seem to be put into place. But of course, the irony is that both the first book and the last book of the Bible were written by people who thought they were Jews. Um, so it's Jews who, in, who discover universality as opposed to particularity. And so that, you know, in other words, there are all these myths that go on uh, that are embedded in European uh, historical um, structures that have to be taken apart not because of Jews or Christians, but because they are these, these moments of boundary building. This is why it's important to me. Um, in other words, when I deal with the first, oh, oh, the other thing is at the end, there are these four constellations, which are rather small, where I do put uh, past and present together in ways that could be read as dialectical images, but they're mainly to demonstrate how the present thinks it understands the past and therefore uh, it produces a myth about the present. So for instance, the book of Revelation is, everybody's talking about apocalypse, apocalypse, and everyone blames the Bible for it. But if you look at what the Bible is saying, uh, it's not what those who appropriate it for the present, either as critics, or supporters of the idea of the coming apocalypse. Both of those are wrong. So the importance is that there is um, a necessity to, to trouble the boundaries of conceptual understanding. Um, so it's not just between Athens and Jerusalem or reason and faith or you know, religion and secular modernity or whatever, but all of these divisions are, are, uh, are disintegrating and need to disintegrate. Uh, so I, I think there is a similarity in, uh, in what motivates us. Uh, and that's important because it's not important for everyone to say, yes, now we know that there's a transcendence and the truth is transitory. No, but it's a project which allows these things to be helpful for getting us out of the present impasses. I think I think modern philosophy is at a dead end. Uh, 
you know, I mean, we've spent our life doing it, but I think it's at a dead end. And we just have to like really be, really shake up uh, the normal ways of doing it, which makes it very difficult to teach as well. Uh, because, you know, Plato, Aristotle, you know, Augustine, Machiavelli, that you, you have the, we, we supposedly have the canon, but uh, it's, it's not adequate. And, and the most interesting thinkers today are not bound by it. Um, that's mainly in response on the transcendence. I wanna say something about this, rather than universality being this homogeneity under the notion of the transcendental ego that all of us share, Kant, right? Uh, the idea is that we don't know what each other are thinking. And therefore we have to listen to each other. And to make that point, I rely on Nicholas of Cusa, who was a real, you know, he lived in a place where people were coming in and out all the time. It's uh, kind of in Tyrol, you know, uh, the Swiss kind of, you know, the Alps there and people are traveling and no one has anything similar to anybody else. So there's a, a moment of necessity of translation in every way. So Nicholas of Cusa, I mean, if you think, it, it, See, what happened in the post Kantian thing? Once we got, once we understood there's no transcendence, there's only the transcendental subject, which we all share because we're all rational, right? Once we're there, then we get to the point where, look what happened. We had a whole second part of the 20th century where Foucauldianism was replaced by Derridianism, which was replaced by, so, so one person would produce an entire tradition of philosophy, a school of philosophy. And we would all go there and then we would go here and then we would go here and then we would go here. Why, why are we doing that? You know, because, uh, it, it, because they're good writers and it's always fun, you, right? But there is something in the, in the task of philosophy uh, that, that got forgotten, particularly because all those guys, guys were, you know, Parisian intellectuals. And the rest of us were kind of out of it, unless you wanted to be Hopper Masian, which was pretty boring. So, I mean, wh where are we there, right? So yes, they're wonderful people to read. So is, so is a novelist, so is Tolstoy, you know, but, but uh, and they're also important philosophically. But I think philosophy allowed itself to be too deferential to modernity's own traditions. Thank you, Susan. Uh, also, I wanted to say that if someone feels like asking a question or making a comment in Russian, we can always translate. So I don't want you to be put off by, by the language barrier if it exists. And uh, hopefully we will hear some, something from Oleg who has been working on slavery, Susan. Can you imagine that? He has been um, developing the concept of slavery. <laughs> so you Wonderful. see, this is another point uh, of, um, of what? of um, Overlap, Ooh. or overlap, of, exactly. of a convergence. Yes, yes, yes. yes. A convergence. That would be. That would be um, yeah. exact. So, um, well, well, Ali, we have to Ali. think slavery. We have to think slavery because we live now. This is right. the point. Not because Ali, we both studied Derrida or somebody. Right. No, 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 no. Because no, we no. live now. Alek, go ahead, please. Go ahead. You are muted. Звук, Олег, звук. Звука нет. Да, теперь thank есть. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Susan, for interesting lecture. And um, uh, for me, it's very difficult way, difficult way to combine uh, two ideas um, of Benjamin idea of translator and uh, tra idea of history. Um, because um, uh, it uh, uh, for me uh, it seems for me uh, that uncombined ideas. Oops. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, I have a uh, couple of questions. One, uh, one first, uh, first uh, uh, about Benjamin, about uh, task of translation. 
translator. Um, uh, what does it mean to use this text uh, in relation to history and past? And um, how we can use this text as a uh, methodological tool? Uh, for me, it's a big question. Uh, what uh, does it give us uh, something new uh, in relation to other attempts uh, to uh, reconfigure uh, history and past, such as Nietzsche's genealogy, for example, Heidegger's, uh, Heidegger's anti philological uh, etymology uh, and his destruction of being and Foucault and archaeology of Foucault. Uh, it's first question. And second uh, question uh, uh, about uh, 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 you're trying uh, uh, to create the kind of method to work with uh, past and history. Uh, do I understand you correctly? Uh, you're trying to create a model, a theoretical a method the logical egalitarianism, egalitarianism, uh, like yeah. in like in your book uh, Hegel and Haiti. Mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, um, those are really good questions. Uh, I, I, this uh, the second one first. Hegel and Haiti. That book. I I at, it ends saying uh, universal history begins again somewhere else. And my answer to my own end of that book was to begin it in the first century. But to me, it's the same book mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. Hegel and Haiti. It's the same book, the same method, maybe, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so the word and is important. Here is history and philosophy. There it was Hegel and Haiti. Um, and is my favorite word. And incidentally, just it's just fascinating. I mean, but you see, also, I get, this is where I get, like hung up, like Benjamin did on these little facts, right? He, he found these little things. He thought they were so interesting. I think it's interesting that 73% of the sentences in the last book of the Bible begin with and. Wow, isn't that interesting? Why do they begin with and? K is the koine uh, word for and. What, that is, that is uh, in, in structuring the book which is a totally incoherent book when you try to make it obey rules of logic, there's this and. Well, that would be, you see my saying, okay, I don't, I, I can make a, I can tell the story of the book of Revelation based on translating it into totally comprehensible modern terms, either as a critic of the book or as a supporter. But I can't explain why all the sentences, it's not true of any other book in the, in the Bible or in the New Testament, right? Um, why they start with and? I have to really think, what does it mean to start these sentences with and? Now, granted, that's not an image. It's, um, it's a word, but it's a word that must be naming something. This is where I try to distinguish in that methodological thing between the concept and the name. In other words, the concept starts floating on any place. So my, my thing that upsets me is when students write a paper and they find governmentality. It's the answer to every problem. It's the magic key because they read Foucault and now everything's governmentality. Uh, and then they read someone else and they have another word uh, you know, that, that solves all problems. No, uh, the, if the development of that concept came out of a specific text with a specific content. And uh, that it's not clear that that concept can live and, and float around, right? So this is the, 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 uh, the necessity for translation. Uh, the concept pretends to float around. As, as Nietzsche says, there can be no history for a concept. He says that a true concept can't have a history. It absorbs its own history, right? But a name has to have the referent. And that's why I like names. It has to have the referent. Um, you can't, and so 
the, the task is to ask yourself, what is being named by the use of and to begin all those sentences? What is being, you know, what is being said? Because I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I have to think outside of my categories. Uh, and then I have practice in crossing boundaries. And I have practice in analogical thinking as opposed to a kind of chronology which says the modern interpretation is the most advanced. I have to actually try to figure out what's going on there that I don't understand. What's going on when an hour has a different number of minutes in it every, every day? Wow, that, I mean, that's amazing, right? I mean, think what you, you're trying to get someplace on time and it really is hard. So in other words, if time and space, if all of the things that you think are constants, are constant, are undermined, then you, um, I call it a kind of liberation. And, and then suddenly you're, you're free to put pieces together differently to think without these constant categories of comprehension uh, or understanding. That, that's the, uh, that's the, the effect or the, hopefully the, this practice of doing this kind of work gives one that liberation. Uh, and, then, and then anything might happen. It's the liberation from, and, and the last line of the book, which is the one that uh, actually uh, our friend Ritas likes. We were sitting uh, uh, by the East River and he wrote someone and said, I'm, I'm sitting here with Susan Buck Morris falling out of modernity. And, because the last, the, the last, uh, okay, I'm just gonna read it, the task, right? Philosophical history is the undoing of the constraining order that keeps the past in place. The philosophical arc of historical exegesis is suspended in open air precisely here, touching a past that is not aligned with the present. And that demands an animal's leap, a tiger's leap, that's straight out of the, on the concept of history, right? An animal's leap, a tiger's leap. The task is to liberate the past from the concepts that purport to contain it, to suspend the structuring schema of history as modernity's concept. And then the last line is to, to, fall, line out, to fall out of <laughs> modernity itself. Is it backwards? Or, anyway, uh, it, to fall out of modernity. It's not to transcend, go beyond it or go before it. It's just to get out of it. <laughs> The fallout, and then you're free. I mean, that's the task. And you, any strategy that gets you there is is a good one. Um, but because you know, I mean, how many, how how long have we been living in late capitalism, post modernity? Uh, you know, let's 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 think some other place, space, time something this uh, it's it's a real uh it's a real conviction uh, particularly when you teach you realize you can't teach what's the idea of teaching a radical tradition that's already a hundred years old oh let's read every word of walter benjamin let's understand this and that well yes and it's i mean i read like really carefully in this book to know that the words, the sentences begin with and, you have to read carefully, uh, like an antiquarian. But but the goal is not uh, is not uh, anything but to be puzzled, to be surprised, to not know. So I think yeah. I think we're doing the same thing, Alec. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, anyone else, maybe other questions and comments, please, ladies and gentlemen, please, please, <laughs> please, please, don't be shy. I see some friends that I haven't seen for a while, like Dasha Varishnikova, 
who is in Germany now. Oh so my gosh, maybe, look, at, look what, yes. Uh, this is huge, this is huge. Yes, um, it would be nice. Oh, also I got a, a long um, remark in the chat, uh, in the chat box. Uh, well, uh, but maybe Dasha, maybe Dasha speaks up first and then we will go in for the question. Excellent. Hi, uh, thank you, Susan, for so very, for me, very fascinating and very inspiring talk because uh, the things I'm myself dealing with uh, recently um, seems um, quite similar to what, you are, what uh, you are talking about. And I think your method could be helpful for me as well. And um, I'm looking forward to read your book. Question, comment, and thank you very much. It's, it's good uh, that this happened, but tell me, uh, give me, give me your question. I mean, about your work. Um, the most inspiring thing for me was that your book is written in fragments and I'm studying fragmentary literature. And my question is, um, how to interpret, how to analyze this type of literature, this type of prose, this type of artwork. Mm -hmm. And your idea about uh, constructing constellations mm -hmm. uh, seem very um, familiar maybe to me because I'm trying to do some not similar, but at the same time, trying to walk at the same direction. And the idea that you can look from present to past with uh, uh, searching for some kind of constellations also speaks to me. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And another of my questions was that perhaps we should look not into the content of some text, but into the way they, they are written and in, into the way they, they are coming to the problem they speak about. Well, this is it. I mean, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, so that's why method, for instance, I, I teach Walter Benjamin, but I teach Benjamin as method. Uh, so it's the way you do it. It's, you know, it's, it's the practice. This is what I'm thinking is perhaps this notion of practical philosophy. Pra it's a practice. It's a practice that we have to invent new ways to do. And uh, so the ones that we think are right, like eternal truth or coherent non-fragmented uh, presentation, they may be just all wrong. Uh, and, and so experimentation then becomes crucially important as well, experiment. Um, uh, I'm so glad, Daria. I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to read what you come uh, with and Helen will send to me, so. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Susan, here comes a lengthy question from one of our um, participants, uh, Alex, uh, whose name is Alexei, Alexei Irkiev. Uh, so he's, here's the question uh, and the, the response actually. Thank you very much for your interesting report. Unfortunately, I don't have a webcam and microphone on my home computer, but if possible, I would like to ask a question via live chat. Don't you think, Susan, that history exists and makes sense only within the framework of a civilization of readers who rely on the same metaphysical philosophical narrative. In the audiovisual civilization of modern technology, I'm referring to McLuhan and a multitude of lifestyles, the integrity of history breaks down into parts that are not connected in any way. Someone freely chooses Christian story, history probably, and someone Harry Potter. Of course, I exaggerate a little, a little. This is in a sense, the end of history. This may not be a topic for academic discussion, 
but there is a strong sense that media production today represents a serious competition for historical knowledge in mass consciousness. Today, history is a puppet whose movements are controlled by a dwarf. A dwarf is something like the lack of a whole and a coherent history, same as story. Liberalizing history means anything goes? Question, question mark. So this is just great, uh, just great. Um, uh, it's long, uh, so yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm totally with you uh, that the, the idea of history, which is really, it's really a modern invention. The history that we think is uh, second nature to us, it's an invention of modernity. I mean, it was de Certeau who said that history is our myth in modernity. Okay, so, uh, and you have, of course, the notion of a civilization of readers. I love that. He didn't just say a civilization, but a civilization of readers who rely on the same metaphysical philosophical narrative. I think that's right. And I think that uh, the breakdown of that uh, 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 coherence um, is, uh, uh, has a, a source in, um, I love the way you're putting it together with uh, modern technology because I, I'm looking for more philosophically aware discussions of the new media and what it may be doing to thought itself. Yes, yes. But where I would begin to maybe move the discussion a little differently, the idea of freely choosing a Christian story. Yeah, you know, that could be one response, but it's not a response for philosophers. They can't freely choose. Uh, we have, we are bound by the fragmentation of coherent civilizational narratives. That holds us prisoner. We have no choice but to respond to that. Um, so the end of history then is um, the beginning of something else. Uh, and uh, I love this. Today, history is a puppet whose movements are controlled by a dwarf. Uh, that's really quite wonderful. Uh, but there I would, because what you've done is a kind of uh, Freudian dialectical reversal of the terms here, which is very effective. But I just want to call out this. If we are left only with critical critics, then we're not, uh, you know, Frankfurt School was great at critique. Critical theory was very powerful. But how many centuries? <laughs> Can we just do critical theory and be crit critics? We live our entire life in the space of negation. Um, and uh, so the, the um, possibility, but this is such a Buck Morris versus <laughs> my discussions with Russians, right? To be optimistic here and to think that there is something really uh, that we can turn into something affirmative. In other words, that that uh, fragmentation is also a liberation. And rather than uh, simply criticizing mass consciousness, one might make it fruitful from a philosophical point of view. That would be my only um, uh, reservation with your wonderful question, uh, Alexi. Thank you. Oh, I see the rest of the question comes in the second one because it was long. Yeah, I see. Yeah, there's a- Yeah, yeah, it, there's a part. There's something, there's another right. part. Uh, but you know, Susan- uh, one, one question. I don't know if question. Excuse me. Question by Ludmila Maruza. It's possible? Yes, Sorry. yes. Go you ahead, listen to me. Ahead. Sorry, I am biologist. That is the first my acknowledge I am biologist. And the first, second my- my education is ecological aesthetic. My question about the connection with natural knowledge and uh, knowledge about Homo sapiens. I see, not I see, we see that uh, nature about na knowledge about nature, small way, com small communication with uh, na knowledge about Homo sapiens. And it, it, it is a very long uh, time not 
effective communication, these two types of knowledge. And uh, this time we see big crisis in civilization, you see? And we must uh, weigh effective, uh, not effective, mm, we must uh, weigh decision, this very important problem in now civilization. Thank you. Yes, How absolutely. How play, play, Pukhyan? Sorry, thank you. I, I totally agree. And that theme, I think, is uh, one we must confront. That's part of our generation. This is the idea that there's this kind of uh, communist space in which we op operate. Um, uh, but the, the argument that I make in the book is uh, don't blame John of Patmos, the writer of the Book of Revelation. Don't blame the Bible for, for the mess we're in. Uh, you know the Norwegian philosophy and the structure of linguist by Arne Ness. Arne Ness, nice. It's deep ecology. Uh, uh, can you uh, how, how spell it for me or something? That No, I don't know it. Uh, uh, this is deep ecology, how my opinion. It is the uh, knowledge which uh, connection the nature knowledge and uh, the maybe linguist and philosophy and we know that uh, I mean, uh, you, you say it's United States America had the American branch of deep ecology and uh, the big discussion deep ecology in US, USA. Thank you. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think the uh, the uh, uh, the Anthropocene, the this whole awareness. The, I mean, the, here's this goes back actually to the other book the, that Helen mentioned, uh, Revolution Today. I mean, to me, the big dilemma we're in. I mean, if you want to talk in dialectical terms, right? We have um, we have a global society. It's one that gives each other COVID. One that ruins the planet ecologically. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one that uh, also has this miraculous way of being in the same time and space, regardless of time and space. So uh, some of the best things and some of the worst things are about this new era. Uh, and, um, but it, it does mean that there's a, that, that it's an object of universality. It's not a universality that's imposed by civilizational, um, uh, hierarchies. Uh, it's, it's an objective one. We're, we're all in it. And that, um, it, that is part of this uh, new idea. I, I mean, even someone like Piketty, the French economist, talks about a, an international socialism that's not the communist international, right? But it's a, a fact that, a social, that, that we cannot have national boundaries they will not solve the problems that we have to solve. So this is a, a crisis, yes, uh, but it's a crisis uh, that demands a, a sense of responsibility that neither the scientific approach that says, oh, we will solve all problems, we will have solar energy and everything will be fine, or the religion person who says, oh, God will take care of all of this. No, no, this is a... a a real crisis, but the word crisis means judgment, which I think is also interesting. Crisis means judgment. You find it many times in the book of Revelation and judgment demands something of us. Um, incidentally, I keep on saying koine, I, I want to say koine because this is something else I'm not, I don't really thematize in the book, but I think, um, I think may work. I mean, there's no doubt the United States is, without the Soviet Union, the United States had no reason to exist as this dominant <laughs> power, right? If you took it away when you took away the Soviet Union, big enemy, we had a big enemy, now we don't. So, I mean, it's just a question, hopefully uh, we will be like the Dutch, you know, we'll just go, go and be nice and small and undangerous. That, that would be the best, right? So um, there, but this language, this colonial language of English, and then the language of uh, uh, your American hegemony is a language that I'm speaking in and that you're having to respond in. Uh, but, you know, and among scientists, uh, you know, Eric uh, is a scientist and now in Western Europe, in scientific, in, in, in seminars, in science 
universities. Even when only French people are present, English is the language of the seminar. That's amazing. But I think, why don't we do with it what the first century did with it? Um, they spoke Greek, but they didn't even call it Greek. It was called koine, and the word means common. They spoke a common language that anybody educated who had to read texts spoke, whether they were in Syria or Turkey or Egypt or uh, wherever. And, and Nero spoke Koine to the Roman Senate. And any educated person in Rome had to speak Koine. And Koine means common because when Alexander the Great conquered this whole area, he didn't bring the language with him. The traders already had brought the language. And fortunately, he could walk into a city and anybody involved in long distance trade could speak Greek to him. So it helped for him to conquer, right? Because everybody spoke Greek and they kept speaking Greek, Koine, first century Greek. It's the language of the Bible. It's the language of uh, philosophy. It's the language of literature. It's the language of science in the same way that English is today. And so what? The United States will become very small and unimportant. Eurocentrism will disappear. And everyone in the world will be able to talk English with each other. It's a great convenience. That's my argument. Let's not say, oh, we must talk Danish and Denmark. And let's just let it be. Let it be. Uh, for instance, uh, when I was in Hong Kong, when Hong Kong was given over to the Brit uh, from the British to the, to the mainland China, and there was a conference uh, to which some of us were invited. Guy to Spivak was there. Some other people were there whose names you might know. And the, uh, there was a contingent from Beijing and they came to Hong Kong. This got to be in the 1990 something, four, something like that. And uh, the, the, the Cantonese and the uh, people speaking Mandarin could not talk Chinese to each other. They could read the same characters, but they couldn't speak the same language. And so they spoke English. And we who spoke English could listen to these Chinese worried and, and fighting and discussing with each other. Okay, so it's not great that everybody's own language, you know, let's just forget that. The, the first century forgot that. And everybody had to speak this language. I mean, there weren't really many real Greek. Greece itself was a second rate place by that time, but they spoke Greek. Okay, let them speak Greek, let them write in Greek, okay. Um, uh, let's not make the, that the big thing because, you know, Americans can't speak any other language but their own. So they're out of translation. They can't deal with any kind of situation which is crossing borders. So there's no sophistication there, right? So it's an advantage. It's the same way in the first chapter I say, you know, okay, we use AD and BC. We use, or we use a BCE now uh, and, um, you know, before, and, and it's common era, it's not Christ, it's not before the Christian era, it's before the common era. And common, of course, is the word koine, right? Common era, let's just be common, let's be communists, let's have a common inheritance of the past. But let's not say, oh, I insist on only getting on an airplane if it's telling time in my culture, because it's impossible, just let it go, just let it go. So um, that's my, my hope. Uh, that we can just do that. Because if the French, my God, the French, can in a room full of French people speak English because it's the language of science, then we can do it too. And obviously it doesn't mean that you don't also write in your own language. And then the task of actually translating, like Helen, I mean, you have no idea how important Helen was to all of Western <laughs> philosophy in, in the last, uh, quarter of the 20th century because she translates. She produces that translation. Uh, so translation is at work there. And anybody who's having to speak, having to work in more than one language is, uh, is skilled in translation, is skilled in analogical thinking, in non-identical similarities, in mimesis, not as just copying, but creatively reproducing. 
uh, and that that is uh, for, for me exactly what uh, what we all have to be good at doing. Um, I mean, like for instance, a, a person who actually translates find certain things in Benjamin's idea of the task of the translator that are clear and other things that are just crazy, right? Which is all right, all right. But the idea is you're always trying to cross borders. You're always trying to get on the other side and to get out of your space. For 10 years, from 2005 to 2015, I, I was part of a group that, Helen, you came twice. You came to Peru and and uh, to, to Baku, Baku, Baku. And we went around having this dialogue of civilizations. It was absurd. You know, who am I as a spokesperson for Western civilization with someone who shows up in the room who's a spokesperson for Bakunian, <laughs> Baku <laughs> civilization? I mean, it was a crazy thing. It was uh, a, a way that people traveled. It was a bit of a, I wouldn't say it's corrupt, but it was, what would you say, Helen? It was Eurocentric, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. But yes, the point yes. is, uh, uh, so, you know, but we can't do that. We have to do something uh, much more original. But I, I would think to be young now as a philosopher is wonderful. Because you are, you are not burdened by a tradition that uh, robs you of your capacity to think freely. And with that said, Susan, uh, we should uh, listen to someone who is now very active in uh, technology, uh, in the theory of technology, I would put it that way. And uh, I'm referring to Nina most explicitly. Uh, she is the one who has uh, made uh, considerable advances in the field. And in fact, I must commend her for her very good article in our uh, glossary of a time of pandemic. Uh, she chose the Greek word metexis for it. So uh, again, it's about mixing, uh, mingling, uh, combining. And uh, I hope she will um, say a few words um, from you know, her own angle, meaning that she has uh, a very explicit approach that she has developed over the years. And uh, oh, the floor goes to Nina. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lena. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. It was very interesting uh, to hear your talk and your comments. Um, and um, actually, I would like um, uh, to ask a question. Maybe it's not very appropriate. I don't know. but. Um, it's a bit difficult to imagine the whole book because you presented only some fragments and you did it uh, quite quickly. It was very, I would say, fascinating to hear. Um, but I, uh, also from my present uh, studies, I would like to ask um, if there is um, a sort of place um, uh, for something new in uh, this uh, book uh, that you were talking about today, about the year one. So you talked about um, uh, repetitions, about um, uh, analogical thinking, uh, about um, uh, reconfigurations, combinations, constellations, uh, and maybe uh, there is also Maybe you could comment whether uh, there exists a place, uh, not a place, but um, a kind of uh, field uh, where the new can come out, something like this. So is there a theme of new thematized uh, in some way? Um, what a good question, Nina. Uh, who I started writing down your last name and came up with organizator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, this is uh, this is from another institution where yeah, I have okay. students, so no, no, I no, can't okay. change it. Sorry. It's okay, so but I, I thought, what am I what am I writing here? And then, of course, I saw this. Okay, so uh, Nina, um, yeah. Well, the new would not be a break. 
Um, the new would not be like uh, tabula rosa or um, a kind of apocalyptic end or beginning or whatever. Uh, the new would be the freedom mm -hmm. to not, necess not, not put things in a certain order. That would be the new to, to open up a, 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 a to enter a space where you're not supposed to be that's the first thing right i'm not supposed to be in the first century i know nothing about the first century right so i'm not supposed to be there so the new is okay i'm not supposed to be there but look at this word and <laughs> isn't this interesting right so it it um and then, of course, the people, if you read, I have like uh, the, all the books in the Cornell Library, which you can imagine, Helen, are a lot uh, that deal with the book of Revelation. And no one's interested in the word and, you know, so suddenly this is new for them, too, if they ever bother to read my book, that I'm talking about and. Uh, so, in other words, um, your very ignorance, if, if you have to be respectful of other people's work. This, I really, uh, I work very hard to, to be, to have integrity in my research. I don't use it for my own purposes. Well, I do in a way, but I pay very close attention to the fragment, to what, what it is. I count the number of sentences that begin with and, right? So uh, there is a, uh, um, yielding to the object, to put it in Benjamin's words. You yield to the object with respect and integrity, but then uh, you do it in order to free both the object to a new interpretation or a new circulation in contemporary thinking. You do that for the object and also for, you know, uh, maybe the idea of transcendence. Uh, transcendence, which is not, I mean, it, it always was thought after Kant, that as long as you don't claim transcendence, you will never have, uh, never develop a philosophy that will be compatible with fascism, right? That's one of the myths that, you know, that's not true. So in other words, one has to, uh, So the, the new is that you don't have to be, play by the rules. The new is that you have to be very disciplined in your work, but not in, your, in the boundaries of your thought. I don't have a discipline. It, 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 there was a, a questionnaire about who is the most well-known political theorist in the United States, I wasn't on the list. And yet that's my field. I teach in political theory, but it's not my, it's not my, it's not what I write about. So I don't write about anything. And when, when freshmen, when beginning students take my courses at Cornell, took my courses at Cornell, remember when I did this thing, Helen, on uh, art and society and everything, they were very excited. They thought this is what humanities is about and it never happened again <laughs> because people deal with either the history of English literature or the history of Russia or the, you know, they deal with these pieces uh, and they're not allowed to go outside the playpen, the, the fence of their specialty. And it's very, um, and of course, one of the good things about the first century is no one stayed inside their fence. And one of the beauties, I, I, I guess, if someone was dealing with Lucretius, and maybe Helen, you, you're dealing with the, the uh, pre-Socratics pre, uh, or the early people, uh, at least by the first century, um, scientists sang their science. Uh, they wrote in verse. Science books had to have the structure of poetry. 
because for something to be true, it had to be beautiful mm -hmm. and it had to be harmonious. So its form had to be verse, had to be poetry. Well, that's really interesting. Um, but of course, so all of these things, they, you know, I mean, Habermas does it very strongly. There's reason, there's morality, and there's aesthetics of uh, art or teleology of nature, right? Three critiques, they even contradict each other, but never mind. There are three spaces. Um, so you get someone like Philo of Alexandria, who, who may have constructed his entire book with a, with a poetic metaphor in mind, when he's handled by the Cambridge reader in Philo of Alexandria, they cut him apart. Philo's religion, Philo's uh, allegory, Philo's morality, Philo, you know, they do these things. They cut him apart. But why? Because already you violated him. I mean, I think it's wonderful that poets that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, um, and even, well, it's, it's too long and too detailed, but you see the point. I mean, all of this suddenly when you realize, oh, the end is important. Oh, this could be important. It just takes you, it just makes you think, okay, I can't know it. I mean, this, all right, last thing to say here, very important. Where did I get such an insistence on this? It was in the Soviet Union because it was during the time of the change when, because I came back, remember Helen, and I taught um, Marx <laughs> to students in the university, right? Because they, they never read Marx as Soviets because Marx as M Marx's own writing were only read by philosophers, but Marx was taught to them through Stalin or through Bukharin or through some other mediation. And they never read the really fascinating Marx right? You, you weren't allowed that. And this way that uh, we make topics safe for people who are not experts is precisely wrong. And the other thing we have to do is we have to admit when we don't know, when we don't know. Ignorance or, you know, lack of knowledge is not a sin. So it, this, it struck me, it was a shame and it was funny to read, uh, to read about the commodity in Moscow when people were just getting Snickers bars and other wonderful things, McDonald's hamburgers, they were getting commodities and they had to read about it. Uh, uh, and I was helpful in the first chapter of Capital. So, you know, in other words, we can't allow, uh, we can't allow religious leaders to teach the Bible. That's really bad because they're very um, simplistic and misleading, you know. So, uh, but I use, it's, it's a little bit of a trick because I use the first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible. First book of the Bible by Philo of Alexandria, the first part of the century, the first century. And uh, the book of Revelation was written in 96. So at the end of the century. So I use this as a way of kind of it's an arbitrary way of lining things up, but it allows me to start with an order that has nothing to do with the way history is normally told. Um, I don't know, I, 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 it scares me. It scares me because this book is, I mean, I, I started going through as uh, the word Christianity and I thought, oh my God, if they read, it has a lot of entries saying Christianity, mainly to say that Christianity is not important in the first century. <laughs> now, a lot of Christians don't want to hear that, that you know, the first century has nothing to do with Christianity. That, you know, I could be really leaving myself open for, for a bit of a uh, scandal. So I, I, sometimes I, I'm glad I'm just sitting here safely with my books uh, in wonderful Ithaca, but, uh, it, and only coming out uh, to speak with you. 
Thank you, uh, Susan. Well, you know, Susan, we, sorry, we had a plan of um, ordering your book uh, through Amazon.com. I mean, I don't know if it ever arrives, but Amira, my mom, uh, says I have to read the book. You know, she's very interested in the first century, and uh, she's, there has been some writing on the topic here, you know, atheistic writing, basically, an undermining of Christian ideology or things like that. So now she wants to have a panoramic picture. I'm oh, sorry for breaking in. I think oh, Nina wanted wanted to say something else. So Nina, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just um, also had a small commentary on uh, some media studies, which I was making for some years. And um, it's it was interesting to observe how they were moving to some, uh, uh, I should say, poetical metaphors in the end. So uh, they were studying machines and um, devices of, um, I don't know, the 15th, 16th centuries, and uh, they were describing how they work. And then um, uh, with uh, years, they moved to some uh, uh, metaphorical um, descriptions uh, and almost uh, something poetical things. It's interesting how the theory itself developed. So it was just a small commentary when uh, uh, Susan said about the uh, about the verse uh, in which uh, uh, treatises were written. So it's uh, a kind of similarity or analogy in a yes, way. Yes, analogy. This is what I think. Uh, see, I, I think uh, the problem with dialectics in its strict sense is you've got to trust that the negative will lead you to a higher level to really get into critical criticism, right? Uh, if, but analogy makes a non-identical similarity. So it, it uh, doesn't lead you into that, uh, you know, uh, agonistic model where this is said, so the other has to be there. And then somehow the reconciliation, this Aufgehoben, this Aufhebung has to happen. So, I mean, I, I do think that uh, it, 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 this this freeing this freeing is important and also I, I want to say another word about Mila Rao's film if you have a chance it, it's available on some s streaming sites what he does is frame the unframable or the overlap of frames so he's he, he's filming the crucifixion of Christ in the same city where Pasolini filmed the crucifixion of Christ and um, someone else fil filmed that, you know, so it's known for that. But of course, the person who is playing Christ is a Muslim African immigrant who's organizing Muslim workers. <laughs> so, I mean, there's all of these kinds of conflicting fragment fragmented coherences that are superimposed. And the frame, uh, the frame is about the lack of frame. And then at the same time, um, there are two moments in the film where the most important uh, transcendent aspect appears and it appears in the invisibility of what's being shown. It's invisible. And that it, those are the, these intense moments of of transcendence that are invisible, uh, but it's not a religious. It's not religion. Uh, religion just you know leave it out, and so you you know you have the cameras in the shot when you know when they're getting the guy up to to, to be Christ, making sure that he's not really hanging there. I mean, you know, in other words, there's this. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I find him very interesting, and I find sometimes that artists are, are really, um, through literature, through image or whatever, able to, to show us something that we don't quite yet have the categories of understanding to speak about philosophically. And I saw that, for instance, in Valeri Padaroga, that, that uh, relying on being able to show something that wasn't first totally conceptualized. Um, 
Yeah, and Meta Christensen, uh, you can you can show your face, Meta, but uh, I'm just teasing. You don't have to. But uh, she's my uh, re uh, research assistant, uh, and actually, she is the one who organized uh, uh, Jonathan Flatley's visit to our, our seminar, or and, and to give a talk later in our among our group. So Meta, say hello. Uh, but uh, anyway, she's she's terrific, and uh, I love it when these things happen and people meet each other. Um, Susan, th thank you very much for your comments. Um, I was thinking if uh, someone else wanted to um, enter the discussion. So that was that's my permanent concern. I mean, uh, it would be nice if other people would like to join in too. Uh, Masha, Savina. <laughs> well, actually, um, I, I, the problem is that I don't know if I have questions or remarks because, well, I work with Benjamin uh, right now for quite a long time. And actually, right now, I am writing an article about uh, Walter Benjamin's philosophy in the time of Anthropocene and how can we use Walter Benjamin uh, to participate in these discussions and to understand the situation. And, well, as for me, um, I have plenty of problems working with Walter Benjamin, um, and uh, uh, well, there are plenty of reasons for this problem inside uh, uh, the Walter uh, uh, Benjamin's philosophy. So, um, um, well, uh, because uh, you know. Um, uh, it seems to me that uh, the idea of uh, progress and the critic of progress uh, is in the center of his philosophy, but uh, on the same time, uh, he just transforms uh, the progress into the um, catastrophical progress. So it's like uh, this um, the line of history is still uh, here with us, but uh, uh, it's... Um, um, it's moving is a kind of a catastrophic uh, way of development. And uh, uh, what, what Walter Benjamin um, proposes is um, um, like, it's not um, the opposition of it, but it's just how can we work with the, materi with the material of um, history, which is like uh, the ruin of this great project. And so in this way, my question could be, well, um, uh, about your book. Um, is it also like in Benjamin's philosophy, uh, um, the ruin of a um, huge progress, uh, a huge building, yeah? And if yes, then of which one? Yeah. Oh, great question. Uh, and I would just start by sort of saying that I do think that the transiency of his historical moment is really important for interpreting what he's saying, because he is writing this at the worst possible catastrophic moment. And what's interesting then, and where the translation would have to happen, it seems to me, is between that situation, the situation of fascism, the situation of Stalinism, the situation of World War II uh, uh, and uh, you know, and his own uh, incapacity to physically survive, that um, uh, uh, that idea of a lack of progress cannot be exactly the same as the situation of the Anthropocene that uh, is our catastrophe a catastrophe that is slow, a catastrophe that is human made, it's made by human beings, but it is not um, by war. So one would have to make the translation of the lack of progress, the translation uh, into the present catastrophe in different ways. It, it won't move, you know, 70 years later without mediated steps of analogical thought. And I don't know exactly, I wouldn't know exactly where they would be, except the, uh, the, um, the irony of the Anthropocene. Oh, okay, instead of a world war where everybody's fighting everybody, it's the entire world that is facing this crisis together. 
And uh, so that is one part that's different. And it's demanding a totally different uh, relationship to nature, not one of domination, but something uh, that I think also uh, uh, Ludmilla was talking about, a, a very different relationship to nature. So how that translation occurs cannot be direct, has to pay attention to the differences. Um, and I, it's a wonderful project. Maria, that you have. So uh, keep going on it. But if it's not so easy, don't be surprised. Well, it's not a project. It's just a small article, actually. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, but any any art, any writing is a project. That's true. Uh, Susan, we have been um, here with you for almost, uh, well, actually for two hours. So um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, are there any questions? Maybe there is a remark coming from Anna, uh, Anna Kostka, wh wh whom I see on the screen, maybe, hopefully. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, because, well, of course, we're very happy, but also a little bit intimidated. We haven't read the text, we should. Uh, just one thing that I have to say before Anna takes the floor, uh, an expose of your thoughts, of Susan's thoughts, has been published in the last issue of Sini Divan, and uh, it has been termed, I mean, uh, the piece has been, um, uh, has been named History as Translation, Historia Kak So uh, this is where you can read uh, a lot, well, in a nutshell, on what Susan has been telling us um, during this fascinating Zoom, I agree with Nina, but also we look forward to the book itself. So Anna, please, here you go. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion, Susan and Helen, uh, wonderful one. And of course, uh, we have uh, a lot of questions. I uh, see uh, in the chat uh, another, uh, questions very interesting, uh, but uh, I, I'd like to uh, maybe underline the, the uh, idea of uh, the problem of, of language, of uh, focus on uh, the, the language in translation and conceptualization. Uh, so, uh, what do you think? Uh, maybe the common language is a a very short uh, period in the history of thinking, in the history of philosophy. Uh, finally, maybe expect uh, uh, Latin expert language, uh, uh, very colonial <laughs> in, in, in the sense of uh, uh, um, scientific uh, elites. Uh, uh, maybe here the uh, idea of common language is something uh, as utopia from uh, from the the, the past, uh, but not uh, for for the future. Uh, and uh, in the in uh, now our pandemic times, uh, it's uh, maybe uh, something that has to be uh, uh, reviewed uh, and. Uh, uh, really uh, overcoming. Uh, so, so uh, uh, thank, thanks to Zoom, we, we, <laughs> we have the wonderful opportunity to meet each other and to uh, discuss in, in common language in English, for example. But uh, uh, finally, uh, the national cultures and national philosophy are capsulated uh, in their own research, in their own language, and no one is now uh, pretend to be a uh, common language. For example, it's not only about English. Uh, uh, we, we just uh, think, for example, about uh, Mathematician Congress in, yeah. in Soviet Union, uh, and uh, all mathematicians were uh, uh, Russian speaking <laughs> uh, members of the Congress. Uh, uh, so uh, it was the time of uh, Landau, Komakorsky, uh, and so what. Uh, but uh, that's uh, maybe not the idea of uh, uh, research of keeping a common language for, for, for the time, but 
the, the idea to to make something to uh, join um, uh, uh, to, to make our own specific expert uh, scientific language uh, in the frame of national tradition. What what do you think about it? Well, I mean, I I have. Um... Well, uh, let's talk specifically about Russian. When we were, when I was in Tbilisi, right, uh, where other languages were spoken, Russian was the language that people wanted to speak, right? And they had other traditions, et cetera, but Russian was the language that gave them access to a, a, a larger world and young people wanted to speak Russian. So um, I think the, uh, the, um, advantages of, of uh, communication with others, um, it's very important. And I, I, I don't know, I don't, like for instance, I come to Russia in 1990 and Valery Padaroga is uh, talking about uh, Adorno or Benjamin or, you know, I mean, what, what does it mean that uh, we have our separate cultures, well, it's not that we have them, it's not a possession, it's that we create them. And the, the, um, the it seems to me politically that uh, national boundaries are, are not, um, to, cannot be defended. I, I could not defend national boundaries given the political problems that we have. So yes, of course, national differences. But of course, you see, this is a problem. Of course, I'm speaking English, of course, you know, and it's easier for me. But, you know, I remember um, Valeri getting uh, Fred Jameson so angry because Valeri, after we had all agreed we would read uh, Foundation Pit by uh, Putanov uh, for uh, our common text or Dubrovnik, Larry comes and he says, no one who can't, if you cannot read Russian, you cannot understand what's being said in this book. And Fred was furious because, you know, what can we do? We can only not talk, right? So, um, uh, yes and no, yes and no. Uh, and there has to be, there have to be analogies allowed. It's just that maybe because in my own country, I've never felt comfortable at home in supposedly my culture, my national culture. So, uh, and I think that most intellectuals have that problem of homelessness. Um, they don't feel that they fit right into the national political scene. And so um, I don't think, uh, you know, which isn't to say that what you're saying isn't important. It is important. And it's too easy for someone whose first language is the only one really required to go to Moscow or whatever. It's not fair. Uh, the only place that, I mean, in places, uh, well, it's not fair. I understand that. But it's, the, it's making good of the bad thing. The bad thing is the British empire was extremely powerful. And, you know, I mean, I, and therefore, and, and, and then came the Pax Americana as it was, which was imperialist. Uh, so it's what we've got. So, you know, I just, I just think we have to deal with it. I mean, the other thing, of course, is we could all learn Chinese and the Chinese would be fine with that. The interesting thing is though, that the Chinese uh, academics are being sent to work. For instance, the group came to, try to enlist me to do something with China. And I said, but I don't speak the language. I mean, I didn't really speak Russian, but I tried. And uh, uh, I, you know, I took it as my responsibility to take lessons and really try, uh, but I couldn't do this with Chinese. And, and the woman said to me, oh, we don't need you to speak Chinese. We all speak perfect English. Yeah, well, that is, uh, you, you wanna see an imperial culture in the making? It's China right today, right? So, uh, they're being very cosmopolitan, but uh, only because uh, of, uh, you know, they, there's a, and I, and I don't think it's progressive to have one hegemony take over, whichever one it is. 
And I don't think that resistance to hegemony can be a national project because neither Russia nor China nor the United States today has a government that we would like to make synonymous with our national culture. I would say that. And Alexi has another wonderful question. Helen, really, read yeah. it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, yes, another wonderful question. Uh, but uh, politically, I um, quite agree with you, Susan. There is one thing that I wanted to mention that although you speak English, you are Greek. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. My grandfather was Greek. <laughs> uh, yes. So um, one more question. Maybe perhaps this would be the last question because it's really getting late. Uh, I mean, here in these parts. Um, and uh, so I will read another question from Alexei. I'd love to read your book, Susan. One more question. As you know, Zizek or Zizek, whatever, reverse the formula of Benjamin. He says that we must go through the experience of Christianity to become genuine atheists. Susan, what do you think we have to go through, so to speak, to become true historians? Some kind of skepticism or something else? What kind of conceptual experience do we need for this? Uh, or is it concept concept conceptuality um, uh, or excuse me, I think it should be read differently. Or is conceptually something that complicates the historical vision, driving it, it into the Procrustean bed of some speculative schemes? I apologize if I'm being a little naive and asking an incorrect question. So no, I precisely, but it, it's written correctly. Or is yes, it sorry. conceptuality itself something oh, that complicates oh, I, sorry, the historical sorry. vision? I, driving uh, it into the Procrustean bread of some speculative scheme. And the answer to that, as it's written, Alexei, is absolutely exactly my point. Good. <laughs> so it, well, it's, if, we do, if we start with concepts, uh, we'll never get to where we have to go. And also, also, let me just say, uh, although this is interesting, I'm, I'm sorry to continue, but it's so interesting. Uh, because in fact, the words that translate most easily in the discourse of philosophy are conceptual words, right? I mean, when it comes to material understanding, as is true in novels, which is I think the reason that Valeria said it's harder to translate, you know, but we can all say things like metaphysics. We can all say things like universality, you know, and even if I say it in whatever language, I'm sure we can recognize the word. But the point I am making is precisely this, that to think, oh, to begin our philosophical project in concepts and to think that conceptuality is our goal, our beginning, middle and end, our goal is to miss, um, miss history altogether and uh, uh, miss the capacity for materialist metaphysics. Um, and also for the capacity of aesthetics in the broader sense, not just art, to be a source of historical enlightenment or philosophical enlightenment, I should say. We're finished with the enlightenment. We have to have other enlightenment. So I would say that sentence that Helen misread is precisely my point. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for misreading the sentence, but I have to, to uh, improve my eyesight as Oleg did. <laughs> um, so this is my next goal. But uh, Susan, uh, we're done with what? With the, all, with the metaphysics perhaps as well. Well, I don't know. Or maybe we've just started. Maybe. Or maybe but, the, dwarf, uh... <laughs> the dwarf is, or maybe the dwarf, I guess is the dwarf Christian or is the dwarf the atheist or is, the dwarf, I don't know, I don't know. But uh, we, we obviously are in a space where any question is the right question. It's an open space, it's an open space, uh, really open. Um, that's, that's the goal, that it's, it's really, no one owns that space. No one can own it. Uh, no nation, no religion, no, no discipline, no, no philosophical school. So that's the communists. That's why we save communism. 
<laughs> right. So it's it's essentially about uh, communication, as Nancy would have it, because uh, he he's interested in in the in the fate of the common. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, so, yes. Oh, okay, Susan. So here comes another uh, remark from one of our participants. Uh, from Ludmila Marozova, who says, Dear Susan, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it is more actual if uh, you see history on the basis of uh, nature with uh, deep ecology aspects. Yes. Totally so in agreement. Totally yes, in yes. agreement. The <laughs> um, yes. So uh, before we uh, say goodbye to each other, I have a question for uh, Sasha, who is the organizer, but also a very keen researcher. So um, I would like to know if she has something to say before we um, part, before we say goodnight. So Sasha, is there anything you would like to say? No, thank you. Uh, well, I uh, probably I have uh, just a little uh, remark. Uh, thank you, Susan, so much for the talk. And uh, I um, especially loved the part about the translation. And I saw that um, the translation is uh, uh, somewhat of a resistance. Uh, I uh, came up to this idea because, um, well, a form, a cultural or historical form uh, is something fixed uh, and is something uh, integral and normal. Uh, but when I think about um, uh, the issues of disability, accessibility, uh, inclusion, and so on, um, I think that the translation deals with the, uh, with the deformation with distancing from the fixed to the existing forms uh, and uh, at some point. Uh, so we can try not to, to cure it, to adapt uh, disabilities, uh, but, uh, or deformations uh, mm, to some existing forms, but to translate both of them, uh, the existing forms in science and the uh, deformed, uh, deformed ones and uh, to translate uh, and to work um, at some mixed deformed uh, space to create some new space uh, for communication for dialogue so that's uh, the uh, some uh, optimistic points <laughs> that i've come up to listening to our talk and to our discussion uh, thank you so much again for this meeting i think that's great and i i love it i love that uh, notion of uh uh, translation as being, uh, you know, as affirming a kind of deformation. I think that's, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much possible there. It, 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 and it's, it's time, it's time, it's the right time for that approach. Uh, listen, it's been wonderful to be with you all. Uh, really has. It's been uh, very exciting for me. So... Susan, thank you very much. Also, um, you know, since we're discussing media and the trends in contemporary societies, translation as a form of deformation is our contribution to the Twitter. We should have a Twitter. <laughs> and uh, we should use those catchy phrases, you know, to end up our discussions and to end the day, perhaps, which we will be doing shortly. And your day is just beginning. So Susan, uh, this has been really extraordinary and uh, we uh, respect you as we say in Russia, but we love you, which is more, we try to understand you, we translate you, we study you, uh, we communicate with you. So please uh, be on the other side, come over, any form of communication is welcome. And thank you very much for this experience. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for, for having me. It, it was uh, my great pleasure. Thank you. Really. Thank you.